engineer at the Philadelphia Water Department. Um, what we have here, there are a series of stormwater planters on this block. There are two stormwater planters at the end we're standing at here. Um, each of them collects water from the adjacent street and sidewalk, brings it into the planter, and the planters are connected underground by a stone bed. Stone beds about two feet deep, about two feet underground. Um, these were installed in, I think, 2009, planted in 2010, and are the city's first use of a stormwater planter modeled after the designs used in Seattle um, and Portland. Definitely a lot of lessons learned with these planters. We were, we were doing them obviously as a pilot at the time, but since then, as many of you may or may not be aware, our Green City, Green City Clean Waters Plan for managing combined sewer overflows has been accepted by the EPA, so we are now committed to a approximately $1.6 billion, 25-year plan for reducing combined sewer overflows predominantly through green infrastructure, will include, which will include projects such as stormwater planters that you see today. Uh, each, each planter has a different sort of inlet structure. One of them works with a trench drain. The other one has a standard uh, highway grate inlet that has a domed riser that comes up in the planter. So the water will come in the inlet and then bubble out the riser into the planter. So we were trying different types of inlet techniques. Um, and when we get close to the planters, I can point them out. Uh, when we first planted the planters, they had a different landscape plan that was predominantly plugs. We found that the, the planters looked really, really cavernous, like a, a big depression in the sidewalk. So we ended up planting them with larger shrubs to uh, not have them be such a hazard in the sidewalk. What do you mean by plugs? Um, tiny, tiny little plants, like, uh, yeah. We decided to paint the concrete curb as another indication that these were features in the sidewalk to prevent people from tripping. So what we're finding, you know, the paint's chipping off and all of our future projects, we're going to use an integral concrete coloring agent that's mixed in with the concrete so it won't chip off like this. Uh, for a while we had temporary fencing around these that really didn't look that good, but I think I think they look really great now with the large shrubs, and we'll probably have to touch up the, the paint around the curves. Uh, so there's an infiltration bed underneath them? Yeah, it's so an under drain. It's, about, it's about a hundred foot long infiltration bed, and it comes back here. There's an under drain that connects to a control structure here that has an orifice on the bottom and a weir on top. So once the system um, starts filling up, It'll send it back to the sewer. This connects to a pipe that connects to a sewer in the street, and we'll send the water back at a really slow rate, a rate that won't overtax our, um, our treatment plant. It's, it's uh, 0.05 CFS per acre of drainage area. It's only about 8,000 square feet that drain to this site, so it's incredibly slow. When we were first designing for the site, we did soil testing, and it, it didn't show any infiltration at all, but what we've so we designed it for slow release, but what we've been finding through monitoring of this site, which we monitor pretty heavily, is that it actually is infiltrating pretty well, and we're not seeing a lot of water um, even coming to the control structure at all. The control structure also has a weir set at a certain elevation, so if this system were to get so full and not drain quickly enough back to the sewer through that tiny orifice at the bottom, it can overtop that weir and just go directly back to the sewer. At this site, it's adjacent to a park, but have you ever done any of these next to buildings and had an issue with basements flooding because of the infiltration? Uh, it is our practice not to infiltrate within 10 feet of the building, which is pretty standard uh, distance from basements and other structures. This is our first stormwater planter, and it's the uh, I think only the second that's been built so far in Philadelphia, and most of them are not in front of residences. That's really just for the utility conflict reason, because all of the residents have their service laterals running in and running out. And we, in our earlier years of this program, been trying to avoid those sorts of conflicts. How are you monitoring? There is an observation well. It's basically just a, a slotted PVC pipe that runs down the depth of the system. So we can pop that cap and look at what the water level is in the system. 
We've also been putting um, hobo sensors inside of the control structure, one at the bottom and then one up top, and they take the difference um, in the pressure. What so you can a hobo sensor, pressure transducer. More questions? Something about it that's not working. Something about it's not working. Um, the paint. <laughs> Other than that, we've had a lot of success. Okay, the, I'll have you walk on the block so you can see the different types of inlets. But this one, you can see the water just comes in through a trench drain right onto the surface um, of the system. The other one, it's supposed to come in the inlet, bend up, and come spill out. Sorry, spill out of this dome riser, this beehive grate. Uh, but to get into the system, we also put a couple perforations at the bottom of that pipe so that it would drain down after the event and there wouldn't be standing water to the level of that dome grate. And what we're finding is a lot of that water is getting out that perforations in the smaller storms and not actually getting to the surface of the planter. So it's not wrong necessarily, but I, I like this inlet design a lot better. Can you talk to us about the maintenance procedures and who maintains? Okay, so the water department maintains all of our systems. Right now we have a contract with a private consultant who is, has been coming out to the sites after every single storm and collecting data, picking up trash. That's in the first couple years of our program so that we can establish what our maintenance procedures are going to be. So it's a lot more heavy on maintenance right now than it necessarily will be in the future. This site in particular has a really strong Friends of the Park group, as you can see from all these other plantings that go on. So we end up having them maintain our systems, um, maintain the landscape portions of our system by their own interest and goodwill. Are they capturing data for you? Uh, they are not. They, we partnered with a local school, Christopher Columbus um, Charter School, and originally they were going to have a science project where they were coming out here and picking up trash and collecting data about trash, but I don't, I don't necessarily know that that's been followed through with. Of course, you know, school's just now back in session, so maybe it'll be something that will continue into the future. Did you use plants that especially love water, or? Yes. Yeah. The goal was to use plants that were um, both native uh, and that would withstand both drought and inundation by water, and then also the heavy salts that you'll get from the road in the winter. That was something that was taken into consideration. You've got a buffer strip between the planter and the curb. Do you have any issues with ADA, or how did you get beyond that limitation? Uh, the rule in Philadelphia is it could be a foot and a half back from the curb where there's parking. So these planters are actually two feet back from the curb, but they have these access points to maintain ADA accessibility. So when you say the rule is a foot and a half from the curb, so face the curb. So that's not, that's like a street furniture rule? Or that's a street furniture rule for opening your car door. Mm -hmm. yeah. What did you call this? this one compared to the other one? Trench drain. Trench drain. So, water will come in this hole and just spill out in that opening right there. And you can see we put rocks there to dissipate the energy of the water as it's entering the system. It will fill up, travel along, and then there's uh, another dome drape down here that will connect that ponding to the subsurface stone bed that's beneath the sidewalk. So in case water isn't moving quickly enough through the soil to get to the stone bed, we have that riser so that it won't just keep filling up and spilling out over top of the sidewalk. That riser controls the depth of ponding too. And these are sized to only get a couple inches of ponding standing water. Um,